Our pace of living leaves us little time for leisure. Our program will give you a chance to experience the fascinating world of traveling, extreme adventures, hunting and fishing. Each week we will take you to the most beautiful places of Kazakhstan. Наша экспедиция началась с очень курьезного видео, которое Our expedition started because of one funny video which Victor made on his mobile phone. In the middle of the summer, a wolverine broke into his wooden log house. Watch what happened. Quite recently, our friend from eastern Kazakhstan has sent us an unusual video clip. He recorded a wolverine on the camera of his mobile phone. The predator entered his wooden home and felt there quite comfortable. The animal seemed playful, it played and had fun. The fun was interrupted by a dog that was walking by at that moment. The video made us interested in the animal and we decided to go hunting in that area. Evgeny Sidelnikov, managing director of the Chornaya Uba Game Reserve, offered us such an opportunity. On the territory of Kazakhstan, the wolverine inhabits the Rida, Katon Karagai and Kurchum regions of eastern Kazakhstan. Hunting for wolverines is allowed, but not many hunters may boast about such an unusual trophy. The wolverine is a stocky, muscular, carnivorous mammal whose weight is from about 9 to 30 kilograms. The length of its body may reach up to 90 centimeters. The wolverine looks like a small bear. The animals live in solitude during almost the whole year. They form polygamous relations only for the period of raising their young from May to August. They are carnivorous species. They live on berries, plant roots and leftovers left by bears. They also hunt for some hoofed mammals themselves. The animal moves slowly, so it cannot hunt for roe deers, for example, but it is very hard and is capable of patiently pursuing its prey for 24 and even 48 hours until the prey is tired out. We get to Uskemenagorsk by plane, where I am met by managing director of game reserve Chornea Uba, Evgeny Sidelnikov. At the central base we leave our car and get into snowmobiles. One of the goals of our expedition is to study the peculiarities of breeding wild animals in game reserves. The youngest participant of the expedition, Lev Levitin, shares all the difficulties of the trip with the adults. The child is fascinated by the natural environment. This reminds us how important it is to save and protect nature for the new generations. From the central base, we get to the Winter Hut by Snowmobile. The Winter Hut is situated at the inflow of the rivers Larchiha and Chornea Uba. We get to the place in one and a half hour, considering the plant stops to video the local landscapes. This fascinating place is Kazakhstan and Russia. This fascinating place is situated at the borders of Kazakhstan and Russia in the southern subzone of the Siberian taiga. The Kazakhstani part of Altai, as we all know, relates to southern Siberia. Here we have typical for Siberia species such as the brown bear, elk, the red deer, kabarga, roe deers, wolverines and of course sables. At the winter hut we are met by Victor, a real commercial taiga hunter. He spends most of the year in his sector of the game reserve. In the winter he hunts for sables and in the summer he gathers herbs. The current trend in the tourism development in the eastern region of Kazakhstan makes Victor a worker of the tourist industry rather than a hunter. He can make more money as a guide for ecotourists than when he sells fur and skins of wild animals. Such guided trips allow city residents to learn about nature and the history of commercial hunting more and live in the setting of the past in the wild forest and charge themselves with positive energy. Until the late 80s, the occupation of the commercial hunter was a prestigious and well-paid one. So it was not easy to get into this profession. 
but after the transition to the free market relations, the job of a commercial hunter has lost its benefits and attractiveness, so the popularity of the trade declined too. Today, the traditions of the trade are revived by individual enthusiasts. They do so not for money, but because they don't want to change their lifestyle. Managing Director of the Game Reserve, Evgeny Sidelnikov, talks about the problems and hopes for the Game Reserve. Every spring, our huntsmen inspect about 80% of the territory of the Game Reserve. The permission to hunt for the sable is given depending on the ratio, 65% of the total number of the species at the time of the census in March. Last year in March, there were 135 sables, and we issued the hunting permission for 72 species. The undershooting of the planned number of species is the same breach of the regulations as shooting them excessively. The right way of managing the game reserve is when the game is shot no more and no less than it has been planned by experts. But it's not an easy job, and it requires special traits and qualifications from the people. We can predict that the commercial hunt may develop in the following two years. We may either lose the tradition of commercial hunting that has been developing for hundreds or even thousands of years, and the practice of commercial hunting may die out when the last hunters, such as Victor, retire. Then the tradition of commercial hunt will be lost completely. Or it may enter a new stage of development, when, like in Northern America, this kind of hunting, which thrived till the 19th century, was turned to entertainment for ecotourists in the 20th century. Many city residents are tired of city life and would like to experience for a few days a kind of lifestyle that our ancestor hunters used to have hundreds of years ago. Our hunters are leaving and they cannot pass their knowledge, skills and traits on to anyone. There are people who are interested in hunting, but we don't have devoted ones. The only hope is for the eco-village that was built for ecotourists. They pay for service offered by local hunters, so we hope that this trade and tradition will exist and will get a new development. Modern game reserves are probably better to be called tourist game reserves. Kazakhstan inhabits three kinds of birds. Beliak, on which we will be hunting today. In Kazakhstan, there are three types of hare. The white hare, which we intend to hunt for today, the European hare, which is not native to this area, and the Tolai hare, which is smaller in size than the European hare. Today, we split into two groups. We will wait for the hare with Ruslan at the positions, and Evgeny and Viktor will try to cordon off the animal. Well, off we go. We start off at the dawn. It has snowed a lot and Victor has to make a new skiing path and remove the snow off the traps. Rustan and we record everything on video cameras and try to assist the hunters. The trap has been shut. We will set it at a new place. At night from the side of Altai, from the Tigretsky Ridge, wolves came. It snowed and the snow hid their traces. We wonder who they were hunting for. Victor is a real tiger hunter, resilient, hardy and calm. He has spent most of his life in taiga and knows about wildlife and the secret pets animals in taiga use more than all professors together. Making a skiing path on deep snow is of course hard work. But once it's made, using the path is easy. I can make the path of 6 to 7 kilometers an hour and if the path is down the hill, I can make it a lot faster. Here we go. When setting traps, one should choose narrow places. Here we can see a clearing, the path gets narrower and over there it leads to a pine tree. That's why we're going to set it over here, on the narrow place. 
Потом будем капкан ставить вот здесь, на узком месте. We reached the clearing in half an hour. The snow under a cedar has a lot of hair traces. In Kazakhstan, there are three subspecies of the hair. The most common type of hair is the tolai hair. It is the smallest type of hair in our country, but also the most widespread one. Its weight hardly ever exceeds two and a half kilos. Its average weight is 1.5 kilograms. The tolai hare inhabits both deserts and steppes and the highlands in the southern part of Kazakhstan. Its close relative, the European hare, inhabits the northern part of the country. It's the largest type of hare. It may weigh up to 6 kilos. Its coloration changes depending on the season. In the summer, these hares are yellow-grayish or brownish, sometimes with a ginger-red shade. And in the winter, it gets lighter, but not as white as the white hares. The white hair is a typical representative of the wildlife of the northern and eastern parts of Kazakhstan. It is a lot larger than the tall eye hair, but a little smaller than the European hair. The white hair weighs up to 5 kilos. It is called white because its coat gets snow white in the winter. One curious detail is that in the places of their natural habitat where it doesn't snow, the coat of the animals doesn't get white. Considering it snowed last night, we imply that the long-awaited trophy is somewhere near here. After a short discussion, we decide to delegate the hunting to Ruslan and we are to video the process. We follow some hair traces for a little while on the dry snow and all of a sudden a large white hair springs out of under the roof of an old tree. Ruslan seizes the chance and makes an accurate shot. The hair is up to Ruslan's waist. The local white hairs are giants in comparison to Steptolai hairs from the Almaty region. It ran along the river that way, but we didn't see it run down the river. The shot was a successful one. At half past 4 p.m. it gets almost dark. In the stove of Victor's log house, in a boiler, shulum is being cooked from the hare meat and it smells delicious. We listen to stories Victor tells us about hard life in Taiga with great interest. He talks about bear attacks, abandoned concentration camps of the NKVD and treasures buried under old mines by criminals in the distant past. To us, Victor seems the keeper of ancient legends and traditions. We don't feel like sleeping. It is only 8 p.m. The upper part of the Larchiha river is lit by the moon. It is as light in Taiga as at daytime because of the bright moon. We walk out to take photos. It's beautiful, exclaims Ruslan with awe. Indeed, it's beautiful here. If we compare all this beauty to an open-air museum, Victor would be the museum keeper. And any worker has to get a wage. The people who will have to pay this wage for protecting the wildlife are probably us, hunters and ecotourists, all the avid lovers of natural places of beauty. Sooner or later we will all come to understanding that one has to pay for the protection and saving the wildlife. Special trained people who work in national parks and game reserves deserve a decent pay. And it's us ordinary hunters, fishermen and ecotourists who will have to pay those people. It is naive to rely on and expect that international funds will contribute to saving wild areas of our country. And it is not enough just to talk about this. We need to get ready to do something for saving the environment. In our country, unlike in Europe, there are still some wild corners with hunters that keep all traditions and skills. If we lose this heritage one day, our life may get dull and colorless. The week went by quickly, as if it had been one day. To us with Ruslan, this ordinary hunting trip to the Tigretsky Ridge turned out to be an exciting experience. <laughs>